Hey, this is Christopher Decker, the host of the Eureka Moments Only podcast. Today we have Sean Ellis on the show. Sean Ellis is the host of the Breakout Growth podcast, author of Hacking Growth, published in 16 languages. He's a keynote speaker and runs workshops around the world to implement a cross-functional approach he calls growth hacking, a term he coined in 2010. Sean helped to bring five companies to market as VP of marketing slash growth that exceeded billion dollar valuations, including Dropbox, Log Me In, Eventbrite, Uproar, and Lookout, in addition to launching and selling two businesses. Sean has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Wired, Fast Company, NBC, MSNBC, and now Eureka Moments Only. Good morning. Finally, I've made it. <laughs> Good morning. How you doing, Christopher? Awesome, awesome. And thank you to everybody that's joining us uh, via LinkedIn Live and our, our live audience here at Eureka. Absolutely. Welcome to the family. <laughs> so we're just going to dive straight in. Sounds good. Sean, please tell me a little bit more about yourself. Well, I, I mean, you covered quite a bit there. I, I would say that... Um, you know, a lot of the success I had growing companies was uh, based on being in the right place at the right time. Um, there's there's a lot of luck involved. We had really good product market fit in the companies. And so it was all about executing on growth to, to get to that product market fit. And then the book, Hacking Growth, was really uh, trying to lay out what worked, what didn't work in, in growing those businesses. And then my podcast, uh, the Breakout Bro Growth Podcast, is really about trying to trying to learn from other companies. You know, I spent so much time uh, advising companies and, and trying to help other companies that now with the podcast, I'm able to talk to really fast growing companies that the heads of growth, CEOs, heads of product, heads of marketing, and really learn from them and extend extend my understanding of how growth works. Awesome. Um, and the way I would imagine that feeling is. I see you as someone who really helped to kickstart this growth marketing revolution. And now to see all these companies adopting it and then get to learn from how they did that must be really exciting. <laughs> it's, it's definitely cool. And it's, um, it's, uh, you know, a, a double edged sword having, having kicked off the growth hacking, growth marketing kind of, kind of movement that uh, a lot of people have and misconceptions about what it is. And they, they um, I use the words to describe some spammy <laughs> tactics, and right. so um, you know I think I think at the end of the day I'm, I'm less less focused on what the words are and mm -hmm. more focused on how do you actually drive sustainable growth for a product that people really need and, and tap into the the forces that that help to solve problems for a lot of people with a great solution. Awesome, thank you. Um, on this show, we like to talk about Eureka moments, which are pivotal turning points in business and life where you had an aha, like Eureka. Um, and did you have any of those in 2019? So yeah, 2019 was interesting because it's the first time probably ever that I had the opportunity to um, really, really spend all of my time engaging with other companies. So I sold Growth Hackers at the end of 2018. So all of 2019, I, I was able to um, study companies through the podcast, but also engage with a ton of companies in workshops. And um, I probably some of my, my biggest Eureka moments were uh, recognizing uh, just just some of the nuances of growth, like mm -hmm. for B2B companies, this, this idea of referral, um, mm -hmm. there's really two referral loops in B2B companies. There's the internal referral loop, which is how do you spread within an organization? And then there's the external, how do you spread from company to company? Another thing, um, you know, so much when we talk about growth, we talk about uh, engagement and, and retention cohorts, which essentially just means if people keep using your product after they try it, you probably have product market fit. You can probably sustainably right. grow that business but recognizing that there are some categories where people are not going to keep using your product. So mm -hmm. um, I interviewed the CEO for a company called Resi mm -hmm. and Resi is essentially trying to change the residential kind of ar architecture projects. I think it's short for like right. residential, but mm -hmm. then they're a UK based company that is, um, is really focused on all the people who are doing home improvement projects and then new construction. Mm -hmm. And you're not, you're not doing 10 of those in a decade, you, you know, right. you do maybe one and then, and then you're going to disappear. And so 
you might say, okay, that's a really bad business, but at the same time, understanding what the advantages are in a business like that, that every year a ton of money is spent on residential projects, mm -hmm. but, um, but they don't, people really don't have a habit built around that. So when they're trying to navigate, who do I work with as an architect? Who do I work with as a contractor? How do I make decisions? Do I, do I use an interior designer? Do I not use an interior designer? Um, businesses like that, there's, there's a playbook to businesses like that that's different. And a lot of times it's about how do I, how do I capture as much of that transaction? How do I build a trusted relationship around one specific need mm -hmm. and then expand into the other needs that are related to that project? So I, I worked with a uh, car buying and selling marketplace as well. And that's a, another thing that maybe you're doing once every seven years. Mm -hmm. And so being able to figure out these nuances of growth where it's not just about how do I drive long-term engagement of a customer, but what are what's what's the engine of growth look like in this business? What's the hard things about it, and mm -hmm. what are the advantages about it? How I tap into those advantages and work around the challenges. Awesome! It sounds like you're taking a very holistic approach and looking at the entire life cycle of a product and and all the different pieces inside of it too. Absolutely. And another actually example was uh, an interview I did with Transferwise, and that. What was interesting about that, which just really reinforced, I think a lot of my evolution has been, like most people, you think of growth as being primarily what marketing does. And mm -hmm. then you realize, well, if somebody can't get started with the product, I'm not going to be able to grow this. So it's really right. product and marketing. But TransferWise really demonstrated to me that um, they're primarily driven through uh, referral. So mm -hmm. a net promoter score is a huge part of how they know if they're sustainably growing. So if people use the product to tell other people about it, then that's the engine of growth. It's a financial product. So there's a lot of trust associated with that. Mm -hmm. And what uh, their head of growth explained to me was that um, their growth gets really strong and then suddenly flattens out. And the reason it flattens out is because they can't service those customers very well. Suddenly, customer service is getting overwhelmed and they haven't mm. scaled customer support fast enough. And so they have to tighten up all those customer touch points. Once they get them right, then that net promoter score driven growth curve gets steep again. And then sometimes it overheats and flattens out. And so really just understanding, I think that would be one of my big eureka moments of the year is just extending my understanding of how Growth is getting every single touch point in a business right. right. And and when you do that, then you can really drive sustainable growth over time. Uh, and I think it's fascinating that you just focused on one metric or one KPI, which was the net promoter score and all the things that really go into that um, to, to, to measure whether or not it's a successful endeavor. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's really what they do. I mean, for me, I don't necessarily put a, a ton of focus on the net promoter score for every business. Got it. But for certain businesses, it's going to be really critical. So like those one-off businesses that I explained before, like right. the residential architecture or the um, or car buying, or in this case, financial services, trust and recommendation are going to be really important. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, for other businesses, if you, if you, if the need is strong enough, if there's a, an acute enough need and you can get in front of the right people through whatever channel it is, then there's a good chance they're going to be responsive to your, to your message and you can convert them without that referral. But it's really understanding there's just every business is different. So it's, it's kind of separating between what are the sort of universal truths of growth between all businesses for each category? What are the things that are particularly important? And then every business has something that's probably very unique and distinctive about it as well and, and figuring out what those things are. Awesome. Uh, so I'm very grateful for this transfer of knowledge that's happening via this communication and you've been doing breakout growth podcast. How, how has that gone for you? It's cool. So the, you know, the whole reason I started with the breakout growth podcast was I, I, yeah, I think we're, we're all, over indexing on what our own experiences are. Um, I know the first company, I, like when I went from, from log me in to Dropbox, log me in, we were, we were so much of our selling was, was through search engine marketing. We just, we, we could, we had a competitor that was spending, you know, probably upwards of a hundred million dollars a year creating demand for the category. And so we could draft off of them by really intercepting all of that demand that they were creating with a superior value proposition. We do the same thing for free. Mm -hmm. And then 
I went to Dropbox and people weren't looking for a way to synchronize their file between computers. And so I realized that the whole playbook that I'd been developing was just not going to be applicable in that mm. situation. And so for me, my, the richness of my understanding of how growth works was going to be broadened if I could talk to a lot of growth leads at, at other fast growing companies. So um, I've, I've been loving it. I, I interviewed uh, the CMO at Trip Actions recently. Trip Actions hit four billion dollar hit a four billion dollar valuation in about four years. Wow! This CMO came in uh, about ten months ago, and um, when she joined the company, there were about three hundred employees. Now they're over a thousand employees, and that's just in in ten months. And wow. so, it's just really fascinating to not just understand what's the engine of growth for a company like that, but to also understand what are the challenges that come with that kind of massive scaling. Again, looking back at TransferWise, if TransferWise is breaking down, like this, this is an even faster growth rate. Mm -hmm. how, how are they able to maintain positive touch points with the customer across mm -hmm. their whole business? And, and then what are the forces that drive that growth? I mean, I, I, I went into it with a hypothesis that product market fit was going to probably be the most important force. <clears throat> and then, you know, how do you, how do you get a team that's not going to burn out in that situation? So that team probably better be passionate about the mission of what the business is working on. And then ultimately, what are the best practices and how you execute around that growth? And so those are all the areas that I'm digging into as I interview these super fast growing companies. It's been, it's been fascinating. I love it. Um, and I think some of that boils down to the, the culture adopting these practices. And I mean, have you noticed any trends in company culture that, hey, this is, this is a good way to grow versus a not so good way to grow? Yeah, I think um, I think that uh, I, I've always been very anti, um, you know, dark pattern tricks of, of growth. I just think I think a lot of those are unsustainable. I'll give you an example. My I there's a service. I'll even name the service because I, I, I think maybe they're not doing so much of this anymore. But um, uh, it's called TripIt. And I, I really like the service trip. It, it, it was something where I could send all of my travel information. So mm -hmm. if I booked a flight, I could forward that email. If I booked a hotel and they would aggregate all of my travel information right. into a single itinerary. And so I really love the, the benefit of that product. So I recommended it to my mom, which is kind of what you do. You like something, you recommend it to someone else. And then my mom goes to use it and they probably probably someone optimized and realized that they kind of trick someone to spam their entire Facebook followers with, oh, yeah. with something about their trip. And so my mom calls me frantic and says, everyone in the world, I just posted on Facebook, everyone in the world, she may probably don't recognize that it's kind of locked down on Facebook, but everyone knows our house is going to be empty from this date to this date. We're going to get robbed. I, why did you tell me about this stupid service? And like, you know, suddenly I'm much less likely to recommend it, even though maybe in the short term, it looked like that trick was, was accelerating growth in the long term, it, it's not necessarily accelerating growth. So I think that's one side of it is the means by which you're growing. Mm -hmm. But the other side is growth is hard work and, and supporting massive growth is really hard work. And so I think that's the other piece that I'm looking at is in my own experience and the experience of a lot of these heads of growth, it doesn't always come out on the podcast, but in my, <laughs> my side conversations, it's not pleasant. It's, it's a lot of times those organizations begin to become places that are really not nice to work at and mm -hmm. people stop getting excited about coming into work. And so I think sustainable growth is not just about using sustainable growth practices, mm -hmm. but having everyone on the team truly passionate about the mission of the business and about understanding customer problems and really being passionate about solving those customer problems. And again, it just, it, it extends beyond simply what are the touch points with the, with the customers, but how do, how do I build and maintain a team that's going to work really hard to grow this over time? And, and, uh, yeah, it's, I, I think growth is, growth is really interesting that way when you think like team churn, customer churn, mm -hmm. and, and constantly looking for ways to improve growth, um, team, team is going to be a huge part of it. Also very, it can also get very expensive if it's not in check. Um, so you wrote Hacking Growth, and I, I read this book, it really opened my eyes. 
Well, I mean, how can companies implement some of these practices today? So I think the book actually lays out a pretty good game plan for for growth. I mean, it, it really there's there's kind of some key messages in the book, which is if you're not experimenting, you're not learning. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a, a big part, and and that you should be experimenting across all growth levers. And before you try to grow, you should make sure that customers actually need your product and love your product. And so that's <laughs> that's the that's the kind of feedback and and you know. Again, I've already introduced the caveat that right. the if if you can retain customers on a product that fits the category of retaining customers, then then you should be able to sustainably grow that product. And so a lot of that stuff is laid out in the book, and and we even laid out a process of how do you decide where to test and how do you manage that decision process and how do you keep that rhythm going. What I found since we've published the book is that. Most companies, when they start executing on what we've recommended in the book, uh, they the, the heads of growth or the growth teams get frustrated over time. Mm -hmm. And that's because the rest of the organization may not be bought in to the mm -hmm. need to experiment, to the need to, to keep driving improvement. And so that's been a big part of why I introduced the workshop is if the workshop is all about how do I, how do I help you create a... A, a broader company culture and a broader understanding of the need to experiment and the recognition that everything that you're doing is already an experiment. Right. You just have the A version in what you decided right. to do. And so introducing that growth mindset that everything you're doing in the business can be improved and you need to be systematic in how you go about driving that improvement. You need to be very analytical and making sure you're not breaking things as you try to drive that improvement. And so a lot of my workshops are creating a receptive, broader team to allowing uh, experimentation or even better participating in that experimentation and looking for opportunities for improvement. And I think when you get, when you combine that process with that culture and understanding of how growth can help serve the broader mission of the business, that's, that's when you can really get that breakout growth that um, creates super valuable companies, but more importantly, solves problems for a lot of, of customers and is a, a fun and good place to work for the team. Awesome. Um, if, if, if you don't mind me saying, I, I kind of see this as, I see growth as data-driven creativity. It's left brain and right brain at the same time. It's often hard to hold those two things inside. There needs to be the right team that's coming together to implement these things. And to have that total buy-in, like you're saying, is crucial. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of times, I think the data-driven creativity is a good way to think of it. I would just take that creativity and say, <laughs> It's not necessarily creativity in the sense of clever slogans, and, mm -hmm. and but it, it's right. more about identifying problems that hold back growth and creative problem solving to overcome those problems. So a lot of times you may be really great at, at bringing a ton of people into the front door, but if you can't figure out how to make them not give up on signing up for your service because there's something scary or something mm -hmm. confusing or mm -hmm. whatever it is that blocks them from converting, you're not going to be able to grow. And so it's, it's about kind of understanding what is the thing that's holding growth back the most and how do I creatively address that issue? And sometimes the first solution isn't going to be the one that works. And that's why testing is important. And, but if you can focus that creative energy around the areas of the business that are the highest leverage areas, then, then that's, that's going to contribute a lot to your ability to accelerate growth. I love this conversation. If you're watching this online, please leave a comment, like it, share it. We got to get this message out. This is crucial for for our for all of our companies. Um, have you faced any challenges in launching the podcast, or you know, what are some challenges you've overcome lately? So I would say the interesting thing with the podcast is that when you're running experimentation you're usually doing it in pretty fast cycles and you're making right. decisions. If something works, like, you know, you're testing a new channel. If, if, if it worked, you're going to double down and you're going to put a lot into it or you're testing a new sign up flow. And usually you, you know, in, in a week or two, if something's going to work and right. if you're Facebook, maybe, you know, in five minutes, <laughs> if you make a, a change, you've got enough uh, flow to have a statistically significant sample size. When I started with the podcast, I said, I'm going to give it a full year before I try to assess if this is worth the time. Mm. And it's, it's something that, um, that, yeah, it's, it's, I'm definitely not doing it for instant gratification. And so I wouldn't necessarily say it's a challenge. I haven't come up against any major challenges with it, 
but it's definitely a different way of thinking compared to the rapid iteration style that I've taken with other businesses. This mm -hmm. is definitely something where um, I have to I have to like the process as much as care about the outcome of mm -hmm. okay, what what do I want to accomplish with this? Um, and and even my blogging kind of started that way, you know, over ten years ago. At first, I didn't blog for an audience. I just blogged to crystallize my thinking about things and I put it out there. If anyone wanted to read it, so be it. And then, and then I got surprised when people actually read it and when I got feedback and I'd run into people and say, Oh my God, I love your blog. And then I would be like, really? I know <laughs> kind of surprised that anyone's reading it. Yeah. But, um, but I think that that's, you know, in, in that case, I, I wasn't blogging to build a huge audience. And then the same thing with the podcast, I'm not necessarily doing the podcast to build a huge audience, but if I focus on quality and I focus on, satisfying my own curiosity for learning, I think I will build a large audience or an audience that serves some of my broader goals of, of getting the word out about what really matters with growth and, and helping me engage with really interesting projects and some of the things that ultimately will make it financially worthwhile to do the podcast. But, you know, again, I'm, I'm giving myself a 12 month uh, timeline to make that decision if it, if it makes sense to do or not. I love that, that you're kind of looking at like a slow cooker versus a, a pressure cooker. <laughs> right, absolutely. Awesome. Let's see, we have more questions here. Um, I'll go easy on you. What, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? So th this is a, an interesting uh, question because I think the temptation is to list all of the mistakes that I've made over the last 10 years so that I could avoid making those mistakes. But I think that my, my, um, where I am today is based on so much of the learning that I've made through making those mistakes that I'm not sure I would want to not make them. I don't know if I mean making sense as I say that, but I, uh, I, you know, and, and, and the mistakes are everything from raising too much capital for a business to, you know, leadership mistakes that I had, team building mistakes that I had, over enthusiastic about a solution mm -hmm. it, it, instead of focusing so much on the problem, maybe. And, and just, you know, all these things that now, because I, I made mistakes around these things, I think it really uh, pushed me in a direction to where I feel really solid about um, some of the lessons I learned from those, where if you don't make it as a mistake, sometimes you, you maybe are less... Um, less tied to um, mm -hmm. the, the learning that can, comes out of a mistake. You're just like, oh, maybe this is the way it is. But I, and in this case, I, and I think that where that starts to serve me is that if I'm, if I'm dealing with other growth teams or other CEOs, I have a ton more empathy in dealing with CEOs now and recognizing how hard it is. As I, as I mentioned, leadership, team building, culture, all these things that I made mistakes around, I feel like I can, I can empathize and, and really work more closely with a CEO to help them overcome those things because I've, I've done them. So if I avoided doing them, I may not have the experience to really advise them on those things. Yeah, my, my generation did not get that. We got the social network and we thought if you're in your dorm room drinking beer, you you write some code, you're going to become a billionaire. Right. <laughs> that was the that was the story I was told. So yeah, yeah. You 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 face some challenges starting things. Um, well, it worked for Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> so sometimes there is a right. path where that works. There but. are are anomalies. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. What what are what are some advice pieces that you would give to others that are either thinking about starting companies, they're growing companies, they are going from 300 to 1,000 and they don't know where to turn? What would you say? Well, that's very broad. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say that, especially <laughs> the going from 300 to 1,000, unfortunately... Um, Unfortunately, by the time you get to that point, um, I should probably be the one taking advice from those people. But right. um, I think I think the reality is that most people who go into startups are not are not really going into it with eyes wide open. They don't realize how hard work, how much hard work it is, for one thing. Um, and they, they they maybe fall too much in love with a solution and um when that solution hasn't been vetted really or tested. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and again, I'm, I'm guilty of a lot of these things, but I think, um, you know, in, in my experience, the companies that I was a part of that have been really successful, it's usually, even though it's a ton of hard work, like, but it, it, 
it's hard work that I really enjoy doing. It's like I wake up in the morning and, and you know, oh, I got to go check the data and see what happened yesterday and, and what's working and what's not working. I can't wait to see what's going on with this experiment or let me see these survey results. I want to see if people are really thinking about this the way that I think they're thinking about this. And so very curiosity driven and enthusiastic about whatever it is we're trying to build, the mission of the business. And so I, w- I guess the advice that I would give is one – um, be passionate about the problem you're trying to solve because it is so such hard work that mm. if you if you're passionate about the problem you're trying to solve, it won't feel like work. It will you can put that time in and it's not painful time. It's mm-hmm. like you want to put that time. The 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 pain is how do I pull myself away from it and have a little bit more balance and get some exercise and spend time with family and those sorts of things. Where if you're having to pull yourself into the work, you're going to burn out. Mm. Um, and then so that's where I said. Be passionate about the problem. The solution is likely going to change. Whatever you come up with as a solution may not be right in the beginning. But mm. but if if the problem is validated and it's really there and you keep iterating on the solution, you'll probably get to product market fit. Then there's a no, whole other challenge of how do I how do I scale to actually reach the people who have this need. But um, but yeah, I mean, the, I think the biggest thing is it's it's hard work. But if you're really um, enthusiastic and passionate about the, the the mission of the business and the problem you're trying to solve, then then it doesn't feel like such hard work. Wow, what a statement! It, it, if you if you found any of these pieces and and you're resonating with them and you 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 feel like sharing some of your own story, please share it in the comments and um, and 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 get it out and let's see if we can help you, Sean. Thank you so much for for coming on. We're almost out of time here. Um, Just as a reminder to all of our listeners and watchers today, um, Eureka Fest is is an event that's being held here at the Eureka campus in Irvine, California, May 1st and 2nd. Sean, we'd like to also personally invite you to be a VIP guest um, to that, so you'll be receiving a ticket (laughs) as well as the official swag. Um, Any closing thoughts as we end this podcast? Um, yeah, I mean, probably I just I just recommend to um, you know study companies that are similar to yours uh, in in trying to get ideas for how how do you actually grow your business. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the podcast, but another resource for that are some growth studies that I've been putting together um, on each of the companies that we interview. I have uh, co-author Ethan Gar who has run a company that he sold to uh, IAC, or he's, he's run growth and product for a company that, that they sold to IAC called um, RoboKiller. But um, he and I have kind of collaborated on some of these growth studies and just like more and more details on how these companies are growing. And uh, yeah, and then uh, again, as I, as I mentioned, just you know, be prepared for hard work. If, if, if the hard work scares you, then you probably shouldn't, shouldn't go into it. Um, the, the, the truth is that you know, a, a regular job is a lot easier right. and, and not everyone is cut out to, to, to do the startup thing. And yeah. so the, the glamour wears off real fast if you just want to say I'm a startup person. Right. And so that's what I really loved about living in Silicon Valley in Boston and something that's been interesting in other places that I've lived that have been outside of that is that a lot of people just aren't as um, aware of the challenges that they should expect from a startup. And so... Um, you know, really ask yourself, do I have what it takes? And if you do go for it, but if you don't, then you're going to save yourself a lot of grief. If you just, just stick to what you're doing and watch startups from the sidelines. Awesome. And if you don't mind, do you mind if we take a question or two from the audience here? Sure. sure. Um, anybody here, part of the live audience have a, have a question for Sean? You've, you've got our attention. We've got countless questions, so we can't take them all. (laughs) Um, one last question for you is how can people find you? Um, so I'm, I'm, I accept every LinkedIn invite that I receive. <laughs> and then as soon as they try to sell me something, I disconnect from them. So right. um, <laughs> feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you give me a pitch over, over instant or direct messaging about 
how great you can provide something for me, there's a good chance I'll I'll disconnect just because it's uh, those those take up a lot of time if you keep getting those all the time. <laughs> I find that most people who do that are persistent and do it like ten times. So you start right. to do the math. There's just no way you could read all of those. So that that LinkedIn is probably the best way someone can reach out to me. Um, my website is seanellis.me, and that's that's got links to the to the um, uh, podcast episodes, the blog, and what I'm doing with the workshops as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's a wrap. All right. Thanks, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs>